This week's 1044 is brought to you by Chevron Dello 600 ADF Ultra Low Ash Diesel Engine Oil. It's time to kick some ash. This week on the 1044, autonomy can work in hub to hub operations, and Ryder and Georgia Tech have the science to prove it. Hey everybody and welcome to the 1044, a weekly webisode from the editors here at CCJ. I'm Jason Cannon and my co-host on the other side is Matt Cole. There may be no truck transportation company with more man and brain power dedicated to autonomy than Ryder. Ryder comes in at number four on CCJ's top 250 list, but with partnerships already inked with Embark Trucks, Too Simple, and Waymo, they may be number one in exploring autonomous capabilities. But the idea of driverless trucking seems kind of abstract. Is it a long haul solution? Is it a better fit for hub and spoke models? What's the business case? Ryder sought input from world renowned transportation and mobility researchers at Georgia Tech's H. Milton Stewart School of Industrial and Systems Engineering to better understand how to approach autonomy and its potential return on investment. The end result of this partnership was a first of its kind roadmap to commercialization based on real world data. And it's a significant cost savings. A few years ago, we decided to get into autonomy. And then as we did so, there were a couple of papers that, that we leaned on heavily to really understand what autonomous vehicles were all about, what level one through level five autonomous vehicles were, and so on and so on. And so, but then the, there wasn't, uh, the, beyond those kind of, I guess, initial papers out there, there wasn't a lot of new material coming out separate from, you know, what the autonomous technology them, companies themselves were putting out. And so... What we thought we could do with this paper was actually contribute to the literature on autonomy and take our actual network, our actual data, and, and simulate you know, the impact autonomous vehicles would have. One of the things which is difficult in academia in general is to get you know, your hands on real data. And so with, with, with Ryder, we had essentially a massive amount of data that we could start looking at. And so we started analyzing that with Mike's group and found a lot of inefficiencies in the way the, the, the network was working in certain parts of the networks. Uh, and so we started saying, hey, what could happen if we actually had autonomous track uh, to replace you know, some, of the, some, of the, some part of the journey in a sense? And that was a critical insight in a sense. So we have been working on multimodal networks before. And so we tried to apply ideas that we had applied elsewhere with one component, which would be automated. And that's how we started into this. But the, the real motivation for us is that we could actually look at this impact using real data. And I think this is al always, you know, a lot more satisfying than just, you know, trying to predict what would happen without having a real network, the real customers, because there is a lot of structure in what people are doing in how the freight are, are moving. And that's what we try to do. Really look, hey, this is a real network. What can we do with a real network? Yeah, and that's, that, and that's exactly it, right? It's the real network is the key. We, you know, you hear a lot about, you know, what we think autonomous vehicles could do, but as we, as we start to investigate our role um, in bringing autonomous vehicles forward, um, you know, and how we can actually utilize them and deliver them to our customers and for us to really figure out what does it really mean to us? So if we look at what does autonomous vehicles really mean to a dedicated fleet, and the only way we can do that um, is really do with real data. And then with the assumptions we know about autonomous vehicles today, really try to envision like, what would this mean if we flick the switch tomorrow? Like, what does this mean for our existing trucks, uh, for existing customers, our existing network? And, and by knowing that, that gives us, you know, we've got several years uh, to, to plan for it, right? How do we build the products and services that we need to, to, to create that value or the network we need to shift around, the locations we need, the customers we need to prepare, the technology we need to develop. And so we don't, you know, so in a sense, you know, because we've got this data and we're, we, we've got this large scale by, by understanding the impact that Tony can really have on us, we kind of know the guiding light that we need to build towards. Analyzing real world data from Ryder's dedicated transportation network in the southeast, Pascal and his team developed an autonomous transfer hub network for the region that combines autonomous trucks on highways with conventional trucking operations for the first and final mile. The analysis indicates the optimized network could reduce costs by 29 to 40 percent for a large network, depending on the price of autonomous trucks, as well as the direct and indirect cost of operating them. So what the study found is that in an autonomous network, um, you can actually utilize these vehicles in a, in a significantly improved way to drive additional savings. Right. So it's, it's what you can do with an automated truck. Um, is really what drives this enhanced level of savings. Um, so 
for example, uh, an autonomous truck doesn't need to go back home, right? You know, um, it, it doesn't have a home, right? It can, when it gets to a destination, you know, it can wait longer for that next load uh, because it's not necessarily burning, burning drivers hours or whatnot. Um, the cost of deadheading an autonomous truck to the next location isn't as high, A, because you're not paying, um, you know, the driver cost for that deadhead, but also you're not burning through hours of service time, right? You know, that, that which is equally valuable. And so we found you can kind of take these trucks and just constantly shift them where they need to be to be productive at a much lower cost base um, and a much, lo- much less the opportunity cost as well. Um, that really deliver this enhanced network savings, if you will. There are three components. The first one is obviously automation. The second one is that's what Mike just uh, alluded to. There is a completely different business model here. And the business model of this truck moving in completely different fashion that they used to do. And you can see actually them moving in, you know, they, they do very interesting tours, which are trying to minimize essentially the, the relocation between different customers that they have to serve. And so that's the second component. You have a very different business model. The trucks are allowed to do different things. And the third thing, and this is this is critical, right? So it's the optimization, which is behind the scenes. So to find those routes for the trucks, which are pretty long, right? So this is covering all the soft southeast here. So you have a, a sophisticated optimization problem, which is millions of variables. So not something that a human can do. And so essentially, this is the, 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 I think this is the, the convergence of these three different pieces that allows you to actually get those savings. The report focuses on how a rider as a 3PL and a customer can utilize autonomy and doesn't really delve into the readiness of level four capabilities. But the case for autonomous solutions is almost always going to go back to removing inefficiencies in the system. And in rider's case, that system was a dedicated fleet network. Some of the inefficiencies are uh, you know, once that driver's made that delivery, if there isn't a load waiting for him or her right away, that truck needs to go back home, right? Um, you know, need to get back to its domicile. Either so that driver can get his reset or he can pick up that next load for the customer. And then so, again, with an automated vehicle, an autonomous vehicle, that's not necessary, right? That truck can, can stay a bit longer. It can stay eight hours longer and still pick up the next load. Um, and make it back in time because there is no hours of service clock. Um, so that that was a big area um, that we saw that there was inefficiencies today. Um, and then just the rebalancing of the vehicles as well, right? Um, you know, the cost to shift the trucks or relocate the trucks to the to the place where there was the next best load available. Um, you know, to an autonomous vehicle again because of you know the less cost of those empty miles. You know, with, with the driver not in the cab as well as not burning through, you know, incredibly valuable hours of services, um, you know, that just unlocked uh, new uh, continuous mover backhaul opportunities for these trucks that previously weren't available. So the way I would phrase this as well is that there was a lot of asymmetry in terms of the flow of the of the freight and, and spatial, obviously, but also temporal. And I think Mike alluded to both of these aspects. So the, there is a certain direction in the flows of these containers, which is not necessarily symmetric. So it's not because you you bring some freight to a particular destination that there will be something to bring back. And in the same way, it's not exactly the time and not necessarily synchronized. And so I think a lot of the efficiencies that we were able to identify were based on, you know, counteracting this asymmetry of the network by optimizing the way the trucks would actually serve the various freight at various points and various times. So it's kind of a optimizing this spatial temporal network in a sense. Mike said that while the opportunity to provide autonomous solutions and all of its efficiency gains is there for trucking companies, he said there are lots of things that still need to be put into place. But before we hear what those are, let's hear from 1044 sponsor, Chevron Lubricants. Did you know that 90% of the ash and soot trapped inside your DPF right now is caused by your engine oil? It's not like you can go without engine oil, so there's nothing you can do about it, right? Wrong. Chevron spent a decade developing a no-compromise formulation when it comes to minimizing ash output and maximizing engine protection. Delo 600 ADF with OmniMax technology is an ultra-low ash diesel engine oil that is specifically designed to combat DPF ash clogging by cutting sulfate ash by 60% and extending DPF service life by two and a half times. 
Delo 600 ADF also enables extended drain intervals thanks to an advanced antioxidant technology that prevents oil breakdown even at the high temperatures found in modern diesel engines. And by slashing the number of regens, Delo 600 ADF with Omnimax technology comes with a 3% fuel efficiency increase throughout the DPF's lifetime. If you're keeping score at home, that's decreased downtime, extended maintenance intervals, and improved fuel economy. That's real money in your pocket and time saved. Before you had to choose between protecting your engine or your after treatment system, but now you don't. Delo 600 ADF with Omnimax technology. It's time to kick some ash. It is going to take some technology to create the optimization that's required here, right? There's a different level of thinking to figure out where these autonomous trucks need to be repositioned and, and coordinating, you know, loads across multiple segments, you know, whether first and final mile with the driver, you know, or autonomous in the middle mile. And so, you know, I, I think in terms of readiness, um, you know, for our role, Right. I think there's still some things that need to be developed, you know, over the next two to three years. And I think that's what this study was so important about, because it let us know where we need to be focusing and doing our part to make sure that we can capitalize that autonomy. You know, once once, you know, we get the green light um, and some of those things are are really building the technology, you know, building that control tower system that can provide visibility, you know, across the autonomous and, and driver led loads, the technology to optimize those loads. Um, and then secondarily, it's shippers, right? You know, one thing we saw with, with the study is like by introducing flexibility in the network, we can, we can have more savings, right? When we think about if we've got rigid appointment times, right, it reduces the opportunity for, for these autonomous trucks. And so, so here we have this new technology that can, you know, unlock this incredible value, you know, for, for the ecosystem, inter, you know, multiply the amount of capacity available in this ecosystem, but everybody's got to play a role, right? The, the, the autonomous technology companies, they, they've got to build safe, uh, self-driven trucks. Us, we've got to build great technology to optimize the usage of it. And the shippers got to do their part and they've got to kind of, you know, create some more flexibility in their receiving and whatnot in appointment times to utilize this capacity. And so I think all three of us have our part to start to develop our own, our own uh, operating systems to prepare that this all works well together once again, once the autonomous trucks are there. So, I, so I don't think we're far off. I don't think any of it's insurmountable, but the work needs to be done by all of us in our respective domains. There's going to need to be new tools um, that, that folks have um, to operate this, right? Again, just doing it by hand, you know, I think you're going to leave a lot on the table. Um, and so that was the other second learnings. And if I, if I confirmed our suspicions there, and that's, again, that's, you know, we, we've got time. Right. You know, to put those things in place. Um, but but it but was definitely another key learning is that, you know, the technology on the dispatch side and optimization is, is definitely going to be enhanced by any carrier 3PL who's trying to capitalize on this technology. On highway is the easiest part of driving to automate because there's fewer turns and traffic patterns and flows tend to be more predictable and manageable. The first and final mile in those types of urban settings, it's a little bit more difficult. But Pascal thinks there's an opportunity to manipulate first and final mile routes to gain even more efficiencies. There will be some consolidation also on the first and the last mile because now you can combine different dif different things to the first and the last mile uh, because it, it becomes a small portion of the overall travel for these trucks. And so for this freight, essentially. And so I think this is one of the things that surprised me. The, 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 the first and the last mile is really small compared to the overall uh, mileage that the, that the freight is, is actually carrying. And therefore, the automation is actually, the, autom the autonomous part is actually the big, the big chunk of, of the overall transportation here. And it's also something that uh, is the easiest one from a safety standpoint and from an automation standpoint. So, so which is kind of a nice alignment in a sense. The easiest thing to be safe is also the one, the, the biggest part of the network. Mike said one of the key learnings from the report was that to really capitalize on the benefits of autonomy, there needs to be a wide network rather than taking a lane by lane approach. To give a fleet and say, hey, you can run an autonomous truck, but you can only go to A to B. It's limited value to a carrier. It's limited value to, to the shippers. But once you've got this broad network, now you can do so many things with it. And that's where you unlock this new set of values on the network side. And so I think that's the learnings for us, right, is, is kind of the breadth. So in a well, way, the, the more uh, autonomous networks are developed, 
the more value that's going to be unlocked. And so as, as we rely on the autonomous players to continue to, you know, I think everybody's kind of gravitating, you know, in the South right now, but as they expand from the South to the Southeast and the North and new conditions, I think we're going to see more and more value um, and adoption of these autonomous vehicles. I agree with what Mike is saying. It's the network effect, the fact the economy of scale by losing and by looking and optimizing the entire network holistically. If you try to optimize, you know, the transportation between point A and point B, you don't have that kind of saving. It's really looking holistically at all the freight for an entire region of a sufficient size that you can get these kinds of savings. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. And so you really have to take a very holistic view of the operations of the network. And then once you start doing that, you can see these kinds of saving. And once again, as Mike has said, we look at the Southeast, but you know there is a big challenge in actually looking at broader and broader region because the optimization problem becomes more and more complex. That's it for this week's 1044. You can read more on ccjdigital.com. And as always, you can find the 1044 each week on CCJ's YouTube channel. And if you've got questions, comments, criticism, or feedback, please hit us up at 1044trucking at gmail.com or give us a call at 404-491-1380. And until next week, everybody stay safe.